Hey everyone, I'm astronomer John Reed, host of Learn to Stargaze and author of the Things to See with the Telescope series. We're here at St. Mary's University at the Burke Gaffney Observatory, and in this video, we're going to teach you everything you need to know about how to use a Dubsonian style telescope, the easiest type of telescope to use if you're a beginner. These telescopes are free to point in any direction with a simple push of the hand. To find targets in the sky, you get them centered in the finder and then view them through the eyepiece. These are very powerful instruments, and to get the most out of these telescopes, there are a few things you'll need to learn. In this video, we'll talk about the different types of Dubsonians, how Dubsonian telescopes work, what they're good at, and what they're not. We'll talk about collimation. That's how to align the mirrors. And I'll show you how to align the finder. We'll talk about choosing an eyepiece. And finally, how to choose which targets to observe. Let's talk about the different types of Dobsonians. There are Dobsonians for pretty much every budget, and in terms of how much you're able to see, these telescopes typically offer the best bang for your buck. Now there's the first scope series for little kids, which run around $50. These aren't much more powerful than binoculars and are really only good for looking at the moon. Then there's the Orion Sky Scanner and the Z100 which are found for around $100. My kids really like these ones because they're so easy to use. Next, there are the tabletop style Dubsonians like the Skywatcher Heritage 130, which are typically in the $200 range. There are larger tabletop versions like the StarSense 150, and these tend to be around $500. Then there are what are considered the classic Dubsonians. These come in apertures of 4.5 inches, 6 inches, 8 inches, and 10 inches. There's even a 12 inch version as well. After that, Dubsonians tend to get really large. In fact, you typically need a stool or a ladder to view things that are high in the sky. These telescopes are for those who really want epic views of deep space. If you're attending a star party with lots of seasoned astronomers, you'll often see two other types of Dobsonians. First, you'll see the home-built Dobsonians, just like John Dobson, the inventor of the Dobsonian, made them back in San Francisco in the 1960s and 1970s. Finally, there are the obsession Dobsonians. These are typically very large Dobsonian telescopes with frames made of wood and metal tubing. These tend to be motor driven as well. Let's take a moment to talk about how Dobsonian telescopes work. What makes the Dobsonian so popular is its simplicity. These telescopes typically sit on a lazy Susan, which is a simple rotating base. The tube is typically supported by a few pieces of plywood or particle board. In some cases, the tube is held on by springs, but that's not actually that common. Most Dobsonians simply use gravity to stay on the frame. Dobsonians are Newtonian telescopes with the primary mirror located at the base of the telescope. The primary mirror collects light from space, it reflects off a secondary mirror, and into an eyepiece. You might wonder why you can't see the secondary mirror in the image. The simple answer is that it's just so out of focus you can't see it. The more complicated answer is that any light from space that hits the primary mirror will form a full image in the eyepiece. In other words, if you're looking at the moon, let's say, and someone blocks off half the light coming in through the telescope, the image of the moon will get dimmer, but you won't see the obstruction. It's actually common when viewing bright objects like the Moon, Venus, and Jupiter with a Dobsonian to block half or more of the light. I found that this often increases the amount of detail you can see. These days, most Dobsonians come with a red dye finder instead of a finder scope. For me, I actually have a Telrad fitted to my telescope. In fact, most every telescope here at the university is fitted with a Telrad as well. Telrads project a bullseye onto the sky, which can easily be lined up to match the image in a star map. That's why every page in my book, 110 Things to See with a Telescope, includes Telrad rings on the sky maps. Finder telescopes included with Dobsonians are often pretty big, often with apertures of 50 millimeters or more. The reason for the large aperture finder scopes is so that you can actually see the deep sky objects you're looking for in the finder scope. Now let's talk about what Dobsonians are good at and what they're not. Dobsonian telescopes are the ultimate tool for visual observing. Their large apertures make them great for planets and deep sky objects alike. As you've seen, they're extremely easy to point and you can easily track objects as they move across the sky with a light touch on the optical tube. What they're not good at is taking photos. It's extremely challenging to try to take an image with a Dobsonian. Assuming you're not using a motorized tracker, the focal length is long enough that even a one second exposure will smear the image. And even if you have a fancy Dobsonian with a motor, 
it will still not account for what's called field rotation. That's the fact that objects appear to rotate in your field of view when you're not using an equatorially mounted telescope. That said, there are groups of people who are up to the challenge. There are Facebook communities of people who have modified their Dobsonians on equatorial platforms so that they can be used for deep sky imaging. That said, I consider stargazing and astrophotography to be very different hobbies altogether, so that's all I'm gonna say about that today. Every time you set up your Dobsonian telescope, it's generally a good idea to check the collimation. Collimation is the alignment of the mirrors. If the mirrors are out of alignment, the images may look distorted. The easiest way to check the collimation is to pop off the eyepiece and look into the focuser. If the primary mirror is centered in the field of view, then the secondary mirror is in alignment. To check that the mirror is centered, I usually watch the mirror clips, which should appear to rest on the side of my field of view on the focusing tube. To check the alignment of the primary mirror, you want to look at the reflection of the spider arms. If they're all the same length, then you're good to go. But what if you're out of collimation? How do you fix it? In this video, I'm gonna show you how to do it with a collimation laser, since this is the quickest and easiest way to go about it. These lasers can be purchased on Amazon for about $20. I'll post the link in the description. To collimate the telescope, you pop the collimation laser into the eyepiece tube and secure it snugly in place. You can check that the laser beam is coming straight out by rotating the laser within the focuser. If the beam is not straight, then the point will spin around on the primary mirror. If this is the case, you can adjust the beam direction with an Allen wrench. But that's really a topic for another video. Let's assume for the purpose of this video that our laser is pointing straight. The first thing we'll need to do is align the secondary mirror. To align the secondary mirror, we need to get the laser dot in the center of the primary mirror. We're gonna do this with a screwdriver, adjusting these screws here ever so slightly until that laser beam is centered on the primary mirror. Make sure the optical tube is horizontal so that you don't drop the screwdriver onto the primary mirror. That would be terrible. Now we need to move on to the primary mirror. You can see here that the collimator has a screen on its side. Now the goal here is to get the return beam centered in the bullseye. Hopefully the laser beam is somewhere on the screen. If not, you may have to do a little bit of guess and check, but for the most part, it should probably be there. Okay, the first thing we need to do is to loosen the mirror. And in this case, we're gonna loosen it by loosening these white knobs here on this scope. But on most Dobsonians, it's going to be the smaller knobs. In this case, this one, this one, and this one. The next step, is to adjust the direction of the mirror with the other knobs, in this case, the black knobs, or in this case, the larger knobs. And what we're gonna do is adjust the mirror until the laser is centered in the bullseye on the screen. Once the beam is centered, you'll want to tighten the smaller knobs to lock the mirror in place again, but you'll need to do this slowly and carefully because these will also adjust the position of the mirror. Collimation takes a bit of practice, but after a few attempts, you'll have it down in a matter of seconds. Now that the telescope is collimated, it's time to align the finder. This is something you should also check every time you set up your telescope, and it's far easier to do during the day. I generally use a distant object like a chimney or a flag. At night, you'll want to use a bright star. Just make sure that you're aligning the telescope to the same bright star. Now, even if you're using StarSense or other technology, you'll still need to do this because you'll need to align StarSense to the telescope as well. You wanna make sure that StarSense and the telescope are pointed at exactly the same star, and this is far easier to do if your telescope and finder are correctly aligned. To align the finder, attach your highest focal length eyepiece, put that in the focuser, and get an object of interest centered in the telescope. You might take a moment to get the telescope in focus here as well. While keeping the telescope in the same place, move over to the finder. Use the knobs on the finder to move the position of the dot, bullseye, or crosshairs until they're centered on the target. Then move back to the telescope to confirm that both the finder and the telescope are pointed at exactly the same spot. Now let's talk about choosing an eyepiece. This is probably the most popular question I get on this channel. Some variation of what eyepiece should I use or what eyepiece should I get from my telescope? Well, in general, if you're new to stargazing with a telescope, it's best to get proficient at using the eyepieces that came with your telescope. They came with your telescope for a reason. Dubsonian telescopes and telescopes in general tend to come with two eyepieces. One eyepiece is generally larger and usually has a focal length of between 20 and 25 millimeters. This is the eyepiece you'll use most of the time. The other eyepiece has a lower focal length offering higher magnifications. This eyepiece is only used after you found your target with this eyepiece and you want to zoom in for a closer look. Note that zooming in makes objects look bigger, but it doesn't necessarily make them look better. It's kind of like reading a book. 
You can move the book closer to your face, the words may look better, but it won't improve the story. If you have several eyepieces to choose from, or if you're planning to upgrade your eyepieces, here are some tips to help you with that. If you want an eyepiece for up-close views of the planets, you can choose an eyepiece up to the telescope's maximum useful magnification. This is approximated by multiplying the aperture of the telescope by two. For example, this telescope has an aperture of 200 millimeters, so the maximum useful magnification is 400. Divide your telescope's focal length by this number, and that will give you the eyepiece focal length that will give you that magnification. For example, if the focal length is 1200 millimeters, then a three millimeter focal length eyepiece will provide that magnification. Now, three millimeters is extremely small. You'd probably just choose your closest popular focal length, which is probably five millimeters, which would give you a magnification of 240X. Note that this is still a lot of magnification, and at this power, objects will be difficult to track and difficult to get back into frame if you lose them. But learning to deal with these challenges can be part of the fun. That said, I have a nice 10 millimeter eyepiece, and that's enough magnification for me. Now for deep sky objects, there's a trick to choosing the ideal eyepiece. This will make a big difference because Dobsonians are designed to be used to observe deep sky objects. The trick is to match the size of the beam of light coming out of your telescope to the diameter of your pupil. Exit pupil is the term for the size of the beam of light coming out of your eyepiece, and it's calculated by dividing the aperture of the telescope by the magnification. You can rearrange this formula to solve for the eyepiece as follows. Eyepiece equals pupil size times telescope focal length divided by aperture. Let's say your pupil size is four millimeters, your telescope has an aperture of 200 millimeters, and the focal length is 1200 millimeters. Then the eyepiece you would need is 24 millimeters. And this is why 24 millimeters is a very popular size for a telescope eyepiece. If we estimate that our pupil size is only three millimeters, then 18 millimeters is the eyepiece that would solve this formula. I need to take just a moment to talk about the importance of dark skies. It's really important to note that your success in observing deep sky objects like galaxies and nebulae is determined far more by the darkness of your sky than the quality of your telescope. For most deep sky objects, a moonless night far from city light is required for optimal views. You'll also need to adapt your eyes to the dark by abstaining from looking at artificial lights, including your cell phone, for 20 minutes or more leading up to your observing session. To find the dark skies nearest you, you can check an online light pollution map. I'll post a link in the description. Now that you know which eyepiece you're gonna use, it's time to choose your targets. If you're new to telescopes or you're having trouble pointing or focusing, it's best to practice on the moon. Make sure the craters are crisp and sharp in your field of view, and that you're able to successfully track the moon as it moves across the sky. That said, the moon is one of the most impressive targets in the sky, which is partly why our book 50 Things to See on the Moon is so popular. This book won the RASC's Simon Newcomb Award in 2020. If you're looking for planets, you'll need to use astronomy software like Stellarium since planets change position over time. Planets can be found near the ecliptic, which is the path the sun takes across the sky, but they can easily be confused with bright stars, so it's best to check the software to confirm where and when the planets will be visible. For finding deep sky objects like galaxies, and nebula, and star clusters, it's best to use a stargazing guidebook as astronomy software tends to oversell what you're realistically able to see. Many of the targets in astronomy software are photography targets and can only be seen with long exposures. The human eye is just not that sensitive. The most popular list of targets for stargazers is called the Messier list. The Messier list was developed by French comet hunter Charles Messier about 200 years ago. In our book, 110 Things to See with a Telescope, we provide a custom star map for every target and a telescope view image showing you what you can expect to see under ideal seeing conditions. If you see all 110 Messier targets, organizations like the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada or the Astronomical League in the United States will provide you with a certificate for your observations. I've provided application instructions in the appendix of the book. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial on how to use a Dobsonian telescope. Subscribe to Learn to Stargaze to take your stargazing experience to the next level. If you'd like to support us, you can find us on Patreon. And remember, the future is looking up. And a special thank you to St. Mary's University and the Burke Gaffney Observatory for letting us film here today. If you're interested in taking astrophysics here at St. Mary's University, check it out at www.smu.ca.